faculty members of different departments, all dignitaries, professional staff, and student. On behalf of the Department of Psychiatry, I welcome you all to the prestigious fifth Professor Narendra Nath Week Oration organized by the Department of Psychiatry. May I now request Dr. Priyanka to please uh, present a bouquet to our director. and invite an escort to the dais. May I now request Dr. Jaspinder to present a bouquet to Dr. Thara, the speaker of today's oration, and escort her to the dais. I now request Dr. Nista to present uh, a bouquet to Dr. Siddharth Wig and Mrs. Anant Wig. I request our head, Dr. Basu, to join the I now invite Professor Vivek Lal, Director and Head of the Department of Neurology, to address the audience. Namaskar, everyone. Sorry for being late by a couple of minutes. Uh, I see esteemed guests in this audience. I will not take names because then ek aadhe ka agar naam reh jata, the fellow feels bad about it. So my apologies, please. My apologies, I never take names, but I mean everyone and I wish everyone a very good afternoon, especially Professor Vick's son and the lady next to him, I presume is his daughter-in-law, right? Right. So I've been asked to, you know, say a few words on Professor Vick. I'm not going to tell you he was a great psychiatrist. The whole world knows that. I'm not going to tell you that he was the founding head of psychiatry in PGI Chandigarh. The whole world knows that, but I'll just add another one that he was one of the iconic colossus between the 60s and 80s who established PGI and took it on a trajectory where it is today. I'm not saying where it is today. We are going down. We'll try to get it back to where it was before. But he was one of the few who was singularly responsible for t putting PGI on that trajectory along with Professor Tulsi Das, Professor S.S. Anand, to name a few. I'm not going to tell you that he was a WHO advisor. The whole world knows that. What I'm going to tell you is what only I know. I joined this institute in 1987. By that time, he had left. He had gone to All India Institute as HOD. And between 1980 and 1990, he was HOD there. So how did I meet him? <clears throat> this is very important. We met in an orphanage. Both of us used to go to a common orphanage where both of us saw the same group of patients. It was a bond, it was a friendship like no other. I would take care of the neurology aspect. I was an assistant professor at that time. He was a Gulliver of sorts. He had retired. I'm talking of 1990, early 1990. And I was a Lilliputian in front of him. I would take care of the neurology aspect, he would take care of the psychiatry aspect. We would both meet every Sunday. And we would spend an hour together, followed by a cup of tea. I followed him to Lala Rajpat Rai Bhavan, where he would sit in the evenings. And that was not because I was his patient, not because I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I can never be one because I have no patience in me. So psychiatry is out of my uh, curriculum. But I just wanted to see the way he would talk to patients. For those of us who are regular tweeters, you understand the meaning of the word tweeters, who believe in the world of glamour without doing an adequate or commensurate amount, it would have done them a ton of good to see just how patient he was with his patients. He had an eternal smile on his face, which I never understood because in PGI, smiling was a taboo at that time. But he was 
so compassionate. I think he used to spend three hours at the Lala Lajpat Rai Bhavan. He was a member of the Servants of India Society. And the room where he sat, I don't know whether that room had an AC. I think that room didn't have an AC. It was just a fan which was on top and did have the photograph of another iconic psychiatrist behind him, Dr. Vidya Sagar from Rotak Medical College, another legendary psycho, you know, psychiatrist who's probably, you know, arguably the father of Indian psychiatry. And I believe that uh, Dr. Vidya Sagar's son, not son, nephew was your student, he, grandson. He was, because we were batchmates, I faintly remember, and he went to Kuwait subsequently. Dinesh, Dinesh, right. He's in Australia. Okay, so that's right. Thank you. There was something unique about him, as was unique about those who were the founding fathers of PGI at that time. I'm telling you what. Their heart and their breath was always for PGI. It was time in fighting. It was a lot. It was a lot. LT1 on Friday morning used to be a uh, Israel-Palestinian war ground. There used to be a statistical meeting. On Friday morning, it used to become a war ground. But outside this room, it was all camaraderie. No one went to the press unnecessarily. No one undermined the dignity of PGI. No one. No one. You only heard of a lighthouse called PGI if you were outside PGI. And that is what took PGI to the trajectory, to the glory that it was once. Professor Wig was instrumental in getting us the WHO collaboration with, you know, the, probably the only Asian uh, center at that time in 1976. I think the year was 1976 when WHO made uh, PGI Chandigarh a collaboration, uh, the f collaborating center, the only one in Asia, the only one in Asia. You know, people, you, you come to know about the true sentiments by what they do. He started the community mental health care program in Raipur Rani. I didn't know that, in fact. It's only when I was reading his biography, I read that note by you and Shubo. And you can understand, only he could have done it. And today, it, it's pivotal because I think it's, it's, become, a, it's become a center. And it's, it's become a nodal center for how community health care programs are being, uh, you know, structured in all developed countries, in developing countries. Today we are talking of mental health. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk on mental health, especially in the post-COVID era. And we talk of communication skills and we talk of this, we talk of that. If there's one thing that I learned from Professor Wick during my interactions with him in the orphanages was to have a sound mind, you have to be socially conscious. You have to be very compassionate. To me, that is the bedrock of mental health. That is the bedrock of mental health. Most of us, when we are nearing our retirement, we kind of develop cold field. Kya hoga hamara? Kya nahi hoga? Etc. Etc. He had a plan ready. He jumped right from PGI and did his unfinished work in Lala Lajpat Rai Bhavan, in the orphanages where we often met. And when I heard that he's, and the other thing good about him is he's never kept a mobile. Correct me if I was wrong. He never kept a mobile. So I always used to get a phone call from his landline and that number is still fed in my phone. That number is still fed in my phone. You know, Vivek, Professor Vivek bol rahe hai. I missed you this Sunday. That message was enough. You didn't come this Sunday. You know, and that's how he was. That is the character, the gravitas, the substance of a man that, ma'am, you will be honoring today by delivering the oration. The reason I took an extra two minutes is often what happens after an oration, we forget the man till the next oration. I wanted you to know the person whom we are talking of, the icon we are discussing today and in whose memory we are giving the oration. I believe you are an architecture. Uh, yeah, I remember that because he, I once asked him and he told me, you stay in punch class. So I have a brief uh, you know, insight into uh, a few things. We often met. And the other good thing about him was, which I often tell my children also, he was 
ruthlessly punctual. Now that's a stress on me. That's a stress on me. But he was ruthlessly punctual. He was always there on time. And if you were late, he was forgiving. That's a good point. The last time I met him was in the Missionaries of Charity in Sector 23, where we were discussing a patient who had very severe brain damage. So I had put the patient on haloperidol. I said, this patient is probably his severe you know, psychosis, and haloperidol is an excellent drug. So the patient got some side effects. I have never forgotten the last encounter. He said, Vivek, it's OK to give haloperidol, but probably we've got to move on. We've got to replace this with a few other drugs. I make this statement in this hall. Many of the patients that he treated with other drugs are still alive today. They are still alive today. I go once a while, whenever I get time. They are on treatment and they are far better than they were before we met. When the Regional Institute of Psychiatry, Ranchi, used to send students to me, students to us, they, they used to be an exchange program. You remember? Now it's no longer there. So I would take these you know, students to that place where we would often meet Professor Wig and we could learn a few things from him there. That was the giant that we are going to commemorate today. Thank you so much for coming. And it's, it's, it's simply worthy of his memory that we all are here and we will remember him for as long as we are around. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now we invite Professor Basu to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Swapnajit, and thank you, sir, for a very personalized, uh, you know, a very lively, and to make the man come alive, uh, that's really appreciated. Just to carry on that, that legacy, I thought that we'll show one more photograph here. That's with uh, Mrs. Veena Vig. You know, uh, she has so so. There, there are some other photos, but this on the this on the staircase of the Karen block, if you can recall. So they were just just staying there, like to you know young people, immaculately dressed and with a beautiful sense of smile. So anyway, so uh, there we are. Um, now it's my pleasant task uh, to 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 uh, introduce. Today's person, uh, Dr. Tara Rangoswamy, or known as Dr. Tara, as uh, the person who will be delivering the oration which is bestowed in the honor of Professor N.N. Vig. Dr. Tara Rangoswamy is the co-founder, the former director for 23 years, and now the vice chairman of, uh, of an NGO by the name of Schizophrenia Research Foundation, known as SCARF India. Um, a very different kind of an NGO than, than what we normally, uh, you know, we, we kind of think of. Since 1984, the more we'll hear from, from uh, Madam herself, but since 1984, she has been associated with that, uh, and it has done human's work, uh, and, and not just work in the, in the area of uh, uh, care, but also research and their intertwinings. That's what she's going to talk about. That research is not just for publishing papers. Research is something which, which should get into care of people. But that will come from the person herself. In 2020, she received the highest award, if I may say, uh, of the Schizophrenia International Research Society, the SIRS Outstanding Clinical and Community Research Award, which is the apex body for work on schizophrenia in uh, Florence, Italy. And this year, if I'm not mistaken, madam, you received the Nari Shakti Puraskar uh, from the President of India. I think I saw, uh, yeah, the, the photograph uh, a few months ago. So that is, yeah. So, so you know, uh, rather than a very long history, because her, because her talk will talk about himself, uh, about itself, 40 years of care. And, and research. So uh, rather than saying that, okay, she started her uh, MBBS and then did her PhD in disability and schizophrenia from University of Madras, and then joined the SCARF, which was a very young NGO at that time, by uh, another illustrious person who is no longer now, of course, uh, Professor M. Uh, Sarada Menon. Uh, and uh, 
people who were completely dedicated in an era which was full of stigma, which was completely, so that was a very hard struggle. And then, of course, it's on and on and on, and rather than me spending the time, you talk about many of those researchers, Scopid, Intrepid, the international things, the, the one with uh, Malla, uh, in, with Canada, and all, all those things, right? But uh, what I, uh, at an Indian scene, one thing for which we all will remember her always is for the ideas, the Indian Disability Evaluation and Assessment Scale, which we use day in, day out for assessing the disability uh, in people uh, uh, with, with schizophrenia or with uh, severe mental illness for assessing disability. She got her Royal College of Psychiatry gold medal, the President's gold medal, long time ago in 2010, and etc., etc. There's a long list of awards. I'm not going into that because I, yeah, I know that you say that. So rather than going into that, let us now hear Dr. Art Tara, and that's it. Thank you, madam. I welcome ma'am to kindly deliver the oration. This is for what? Pointer. There, though? Yeah. Oh. For a few minutes, I'm not going to wear the mask, and you'll know why. Good afternoon, and thanks to everybody here for bestowing this great honor on me for to deliver uh, Professor Wiggs' uh, oration. Um, a lot has been said. I must tell you, uh, uh, Basu, that after you sent the circular, I had about 10 people writing to me about Dr. Vick and how, you know, uh, it's so good that I'm able to uh, deliver the oration. Uh, but what I'm saying is terribly, terribly personal. And um, as I said, uh, talking about Dr. Vick is like carrying coals to Newcastle here. Uh, when I was... Uh, uh, Dr. Vig used to come to GH, uh, Madras Medical College, as an examiner. And that's when I first saw him. But he was out there and I was here. So, like, there was no real connect at that point in time, and we used to look up like that. Uh, but later on, when I went to WHO for a series of meetings, uh, everybody, uh, because they knew I was Indian, everybody would come to me and tell me how great Dr. Vig was. He was in the Afro region as a uh, a WHO representative, and they would talk about the phenomenal work that he did as a WHO representative. And that used to be, I mean, I used to feel very proud because it's not very often that we hear good things said about Indian psychiatrists. So when you hear something like that, it, it really, uh, uh, you know, makes you, it, it, it was inspirational. But what I'm going to tell you today is this is a letter that I received from Dr. Wick. Okay? This was 12th December 2001. So how many years ago? 21 years ago. Hmm? And I'll tell you why he wrote this letter. It's not a very long letter, as you can see. I was born with cleft lip and palate. Some of you might have guessed it. And uh, so I had written about it, about the problems I had, the challenges I had, and how I overcame them. You know, I had written in the Hindu. Hindu is a very uh, well-known newspaper in uh, Tamil Nadu in Chennai. So the, it was titled Against All Odds. So I received a lot of letters, but this one uh, was from Dr. Wick, dated 2001, 21 years ago. Dear Tara, I have read your recent personal article in the Hindu. I have been an admirer of your achievements for many years, but my admiration for you has gone up further after reading this article. Keep up your good work. So I hit cloud nine. What more endorsement or validation of my work do I want 
It's much better than all the awards that you were talking about, Basu. I mean, awards come and go, but I think something like this, and that's why this letter I've kept for 21 years. You know, I mean, it's, so, <clears throat> so this only shows, I mean, I may not have the kind of, I may not have had the contact that you people had with him on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, I think uh, he was the most inspirational psychiatrist of his generation that I have seen. And uh, thank you again very much uh, for giving me this uh, honor and opportunity. Now I am going to wear my mask for the simple reason that I'm going to be traveling extensively for the next few days and therefore please forgive me. So we founded SCARF in 1984 uh, and uh, the main founder was Dr. Sharda Menon, Padma Bhushan, uh, who was superintendent of the mental hospital in Chennai. Those days it was still mental hospital. Uh, and uh, Dr. Menon and Dr. Rajkumar and uh, we founded it. Like he said, we are a different kind of NGO in the sense uh, usual NGOs only deliver care. But we were very much into research, training, awareness, lobbying. And now very recently we have expanded to youth mental health and dementia. Uh, we are now a WHO collaborating center. We have been a WHO collaborating center for the last 20 years. So this is a book that I have handed over to your director. Please, I mean, in fact, even the e-book is available. If you want to go through it, uh, I, I'll be happy to send you the link. <clears throat> now, before, before I go into this, what I'm basically going to talk to you about is uh, when I first uh, wanted to do research, in SCARF itself, there was a lot of opposition. It was not an easy story, you know, uh, because a lot of my board members and even some of my senior psychiatrists asked me, why are you doing research? What is the point? As it is, we have minimal resources. Should that not be spent in care and programs? Why are you doing research? So it was not easy, you know, for me to convince people that research is essential and research is important. Therefore, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about the, all the major projects that we have done. We have done a lot more. And let me tell you, don't, don't even bother to get into the details of the individual projects. It's well nigh impossible for you to understand about all the projects in 40 minutes. It will take you 40 hours, to be honest. I mean, if you really want to come to grips with the results and the implications and so on. But the basic thing is, as he said, I, I'm going to say, how we utilized the process of research, the uh, results of the research, and how did it feed into our service programs. Because as you know, in low resource settings like India, most of us can only do clinical research or social research. It's only a few centers that are very well funded by DBT and DST, which can do biological research. So that, that, that's going to be the basic premise of my talk. How do you, how do, what is a? connection or interconnectedness. So this, as you know, uh, is a favorite work of mine. <clears throat> it started with the uh, uh, called SOFECOS, which was uh, funded by the ICMR. It was done in three sites, Lucknow, Delhi, and uh, no, not Delhi, Lucknow, Vellore, and Chennai. And I followed up these patients. Now I have followed them up for 35 years. This is one of the longest follow-up studies in this part of the world. So they, I'm only going to tell you, as I said, a glimpse of the findings. Uh, it, most of them were, all of them were first episode patients. And what was, what intrigued many Western readers is a very low level of drug and alcohol abuse in first episode patients that we had. But even now in Chennai, in SCARF, we find a very low level of drug and alcohol abuse. I don't know what the explanation is. And at 35 years, just look at the 35 years, if we were able to follow up 33%. But what is really very interesting is 35% were dead. And they were all pretty young when they started. They were only about 21 or so. So at the most, they were like in their 50s. And suicides accounted for seven out of these 32 patients who had died. And just as we all know, the commonest pattern, of course, was remission, I mean, relapses. People had multiple relapses, about 63%. But what is heartening is quite a number of them on treatment 
were still on treatment and some of them were in scarf. Now deaths, as I told you, 32 out of 90 people died over 35 years. God knows how many more died because even people who dropped out, some of them could have died and we didn't, may not have had the information. And most of the suicides were hanging, self-immolation and so on. And the bane of finding the cause of deaths in our population, not just psychiatric patients. Very often people die at home and nobody knows the cause because nothing gets documented very well. So we really did not know why somebody had actually died. And the other interesting finding we had, we had was, of these, just the dead people, 50% of them were never married, 22% of them were separated or divorced. So 72% did not have a partner of the people who died. So the question that arose in my mind was, does marriage protect against early deaths? It's a tall order. You know, I mean, it's not marriage per se which protects you, but the kind of support you have from the spouse in taking you for treatment, in ensuring an adherence. I mean, I, I, I'm still doing analysis on that, but that's just an interesting finding we had, you know. And maybe some of you youngsters must do that kind of research here, you know, and see of the people with bad prognosis, how many are married and how many are not. It's well worth looking into it. So what did we learn from all this and how did we apply this knowledge? We knew how to do long-term follow-up studies. We knew how to handle dropouts. We knew how to aggressively follow up patients. And we knew that special needs of women had to be taken into consideration when you plan psychosocial rehabilitation for them. And more importantly, it becomes, it's, it's vital to monitor the physical health of these people. And uh, if you come to this side, I'm sure you, you all know you, you are running a huge hospital. Wrong addresses given at the time of admission. We should all, beware of this. We take two to three addresses because that was one of the problems we had in tracing these dropouts. One thing is they change. There's a lot of internal urban migration. The other is they give the wrong address and, and just dump the person and, and get away. The second... Uh, program was a disability in schizophrenia. That was my PhD. Uh, the main findings were people were largely concerned about occupational disability. I mean, like they would say, it doesn't matter if he talks to himself once in a way or smiles, but if he can go for a job and bring back some money and look after himself and his family, we are more than happy. So that, is, that was the main finding of, of course, my lifelong regret is that I never published this. You know, can you believe that? Uh, I force everybody to publish, but somehow something happened and I could not uh, publish this. But the main thing which came out of this PhD was all along people from other disability groups, you know, we always have competitors wherever we go, uh, for like the physical disability, the sensory disability. They were saying, how do you, how do you say it's disability? You show us how the person is disabled. So that is when my PhD data came in handy and I had to lobby with them very hard, lobby both at the state level and with the central level. And that led to the recognition or inclusion of mental disability in the Persons with Disabilities Act as early as 1995. Of course, Nimhans was also lobbying, uh, but that was one of the things that I could effectively use. And then of course, it led to the development of the instrument ideas. Which, was, which is gazetted by the ministry and which is an official tool that is being used. So PhDs should not sit in the libraries or just in journals. They should get translated into active action which will promote the well-being of people. The third study we did was what is recovery? You know, recovery now is a very popular term. There are recovery-oriented programs, there are recovery-oriented centers in, in the US. So uh, we did a lot of work on, on the recovery. I'm not getting into details of that. But the interesting thing was, what, what did people, families, patients think? What, what was recovery according to them? One was not having to take medicines anymore. That is recovery. I'm sure all of you are clinicians. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. And this is especially with men. Participating in family functions. That again was recovery to them. 
and no relapses, worsen, no, no worsening of symptoms, and understanding of emotions. That also is recovery, because very often you have people say, the father's dead body is lying there, madam, and he doesn't even shed a tear. I mean, the family feels so sad that this person is not even able to express his emotions. So uh, that really tears into them. So as I said, female said, once a doctor, based on my be behavior, says that I can stop medicines, only then I will consider myself recovered. And what did the men say? When I don't shift my jobs, or when I, in fact, they also said when I <clears throat> get job then, I am a normal person like others. So their concept of recovery is very different from, uh, as clinicians or researchers, from our concept of recovery. So we have prioritized recovery-oriented interventions using patient-centric language. We have engaged patients and family in the recovery processes. So uh, even peer support service some pilot work that we are doing. We have established a LEAP a program in SCARF. So this is how this was used. Some of you might know that, uh, certainly Dr. Avasti will know, that the Mental Health Act has an advanced directives. So what this basically means is, when a person comes to you, you ask him, what is it you want, want to do? I mean, do you want, uh, where do you want to get treated? What kind of treatment do you want? Do you want ECTs, any other treatment-related specification? So as a pilot, we just did this on a, on a sample of patients uh, who came to SCARF. And to our surprise, many of them were able to articulate how this is going to be recorded. All that is another thing altogether, you know? And how we are going to use it for them is a different issue. But we found that these were the results. Many of them said, 53% said, I want to be only in SCARF. I want to be treated only in SCARF. So it goes on like that. So what did we learn? We, we learned that this is a pilot attempt to study the advanced directives. Now, in SCARF, we are using it as a part of our routine practice, more to train our younger colleagues you know, in how to engage patients in getting this kind of information. And quite contrary to what we think, they know a lot. You know, It's just that we don't spend enough time with them. Uh, and they are very clear of what they want and what they don't want. The next study was abnormal movements in schizophrenia. Kreplin, for those of you who have read Kreplin, said, describes a person with schizophrenia those days when there was no treatment available, and he describes beautifully the abnormal movements, very similar to tardive dyskinesia. So we said, uh, it, it's not so much me, but my uh, our collaborator, Dr. Robin McReady from Scotland, he came and said, uh, Tara, this is an idea I have. I feel that even in uh, unmedicated patients, you may find abnormal movements. So can we do this study in India? And so on. So we had a series of studies, and we did MRI studies on them. <clears throat> and these MRI studies were, again, replicated. And what did we find? In never treated subjects, dyskinesia was present in 35%. So don't always blame the antipsychotic. And especially this combination of age and not being treated with schizophrenia accelerates the pro It's all very neurological, doctor. It uh, accelerates the process of uh, dyskinesia. In, that's what we found in 35%. And Parkinsonism itself we found in 15% of the patients. <clears throat> so I mean, all this has been published. So how did we apply this knowledge? We initiated a community mental health program in that catchment area because we found the average duration of untreated psychosis in any part of India, in rural India, is about 10 years. Probably in states like Bihar and Uttarakhand, it might be more because there are no there are very few psychiatrists. But even in Tamil Nadu, where we have a fairly good system, the DUP is about uh, 10 years. So we thought we should initiate a lot of community mental health programs. So, th so this is a community mental health program uh, which uh, we initiated in, in Tirupurur. Before the, okay, I, I'll tell you something. 
what we did was after we did the community mental health program when we exited we had 440 cases then i told my uh, colleagues my junior colleagues after about 10 years i told them let's go and see let's go and revisit that place you know and see how many of them are on treatment what is happening to all those patients you know see i'll tell you the problem with ngo workers our work depends on the sponsorship we have see if we are sponsored for say 5 years or 3 years we do that much of work but the, the bane there is sustainability because we don't have the resources to sustain these community level programs okay now we have the dmhp but dmhp has its own limitations so we so we revisited this and we found that many many of them about 60% of them had not taken any treatment at all so that was one of the most discussed papers which we published in the international journal of health systems so having known this how did we what did we do how did we apply this knowledge we resorted to telepsychiatry clinics to improve access we trained a lot of community level workers we felt regular psychoeducation was important and more importantly involving local stakeholders see this is what i wanted to say many people think i mean when you go as uh, when you go for exams and you ask people what community mental health is they think delivering services outside a building you know like you saw it under the tree or somewhere in a village is community mental health i think that's a totally wrong assumption just moving geographically from one place to another place is not community mental health community health is involving the local community involving the stakeholders that is what is meant by community mental health and not merely dispensing the same haloperidol or risperidone outside you know like you saw under the tree there that, that that is not community mental health then the next study that i'm talking about is the copsy trial it was led by graham tonicroft at the kcl where basically we again gave collaborative community based care it was an rct trial very uh, difficult actually it was uh, to do it properly and uh, we used extensively we used community health workers and we produced some excellent manuals which are being used so this is all the copsy uh, intervention material that we produced this has been translated into many languages if any of you want you can write to us and the centers were uh, goa and uh, goa and chennai but what we did find was you just look at the chennai bit that's the first one we found that both symptomatology and disability came down and that happened only in chennai uh, with this complex intervention being delivered so it works if it works if you do it the proper way but what we were uh, very uh, happy about was the informed consent procedure material that we had developed as part of the study where for a totally illiterate population a rural population how do you even explain to them the process of informed consent first of all they don't understand what the study is about you know so to explain the process of informed consent this is what we had these are all the materials we had used like the coin you know if it is heads and tails that's something that they easily understand so these were some of the uh, 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 packages that we had developed which i i think ha- are being used extensively so as i said the manuals and training procedures were developed and utilization of flip charts and these f- using flip charts and uh, these procedures are far more easier with a rural illiterate population to convey what you want to say so having done all this knowing that there's whole lot of untreated patients uh, with the dup as i said of 10 years we start started telepsychiatry in a big way it was funded by the tata trust we chose a very a rather backward district in tamil nadu called pudukote when we started there was no dmhp there so uh, and we uh, i should say that we introduced mobile telepsychiatry first time i i i am very wary about saying first time for anything because you don't know 
which corner of the world has what, you know? So I would say, yes, this, this is one of the few mobile telepsychiatry units, or maybe there are no mo mobile telepsychiatry units, I'm not sure. But this is a bus that we had put together, and all the equipment was inside the bus. The psychiatrist was sitting in Chennai, and, and, and the community health workers were picking up the patients. They were, there was a pharmacy on the bus, and there was a general physician who was looking after the physical uh, aspects of the patients. All that was done. And this bus would move from place to place, uh, picking up patients and connecting to us. Of course, once in two months, we did go and make a face-to-face -face visit, because I think nothing like a real face-to-face -face, uh, visit. Uh, so we pioneered this. And unfortunately, now um, the funding stopped. So we had to kind of give up this program. But what we had done by then was to integrate all these patients into the district mental health program. Because by then, Pudukote had a district mental health program. So the reach of the clinics was extremely good. And strangely, there was not so much stigma. Getting into the bus and getting out was not considered very stigmatized. In fact, people liked the yellow and the blue and all that. And 45% uh, of the service utilizers were actually from outside the catchment area. And when they do, I just forget what is, the most important message here is, if you are able to ensure three visits, consecutive visits of the patient to the clinic, then they are there to stay. The maximum dropout happens between visit one and visit three. I mean, there will be dropouts later, but, but generally, this is what our data showed. So we said, we told all the CLWs and all our staff, make a major push in that direction and make sure that all these people come at least for the first three consecutive visits. And then you then you kind of, you know, have them with you. At least and they have confidence, there's much more rapport building and so on. So, uh, and this knowledge also helped us start telepsychiatric clinics during the COVID pandemic. Now, of course, you know, the government of India is going to inaugurate the Man Tele Manas program sometime next month, I think. Oh, is that so? Okay. So, uh, which means it's uh, kind of scaling up and uh, uh, really doing good. And I know Chandigarh also has done very pioneering work in telepsychiatry. I've read Savita's papers on that. So now telepsychiatry is now offered as part of routine clinical service. Then this is the ongoing study that we have called Intrepid. I for India, N for Nigeria, T for Trinidad. These are the three sites. Of course, Trinidad is not the Lamy countryside, but the Nigeria and India are. And basically, we looked at incident presentation, two-year course and outcome, and more importantly, the co-occurrence of physical health problems. We chose to work in a rural area because I do believe that is where services are really required. You know, So we chose a rural area as our uh, catchment area, where the other two sites are chosen, urban areas. So this is a publication. Uh, it's coordinated at the, by the King's College in London. And I'll skip this. But what, what we saw in India was that they actually we found more women than men, whereas the other two sites had more men than women. <clears throat> so there were more untreated persons with psychosis in India. Family was involved in the help-seeking process in about 75%. Uh, but in Trinidad, uh, they had a lot of cannabis-induced psychosis, which, which is not there on the slide. And the types of visits varied over different uh, uh, time time periods. And as I said, lifestyle factor, which is possibly cannabis use, that was the most perceived cause of illness in Trinidad. These are preliminary findings we had to do the analysis. Then this is a very interesting, uh, I don't bother to read too much, but what, uh, just listen to me. Uh, we all, always keep saying distance access, you know, distance from the center to the thing matters, and that's one of the reasons persons remain untreated. But this very, the credit goes to one of the research staff on the project. They took the distance, they measured the distance from the place, the residence of the patient to where they actually sought help. And they found that people like to move long distances. Many of them came to Chennai to the Institute of Mental Health to seek care. 
while there was a DMSP, there were two private practitioners. They were all there in that catchment area. But instead, they traveled about 60 kilometers, spent a lot more money, and, and went to the Institute of Mental Health. So uh, we are not very sure. This is something that we need to look into. Uh, see, they, on an average, they have traveled 41.6 kilometers to access service. So this is, again, a very uh, very preliminary uh, finding that we have. We need to explore more into it. But anyway, some of you, again, can pick up the threads and do it here. The other activities we carried out were during the pandemic, we gave a lot of relief. We got some uh, friends from abroad who contributed money, and we helped a lot of families with food and so on. So again, uh, an intervention model is being designed for the interim three grant. We, we are going to apply for it. And co-designing the interventions with people with lived experience. That is, uh, that, that's really going to happen this time. And the other thing that we also found was um, we need to work as an NGO. We need to work with the public health system. We need to work with government. You know, we can't sit in isolation and work. The other major program that we have is early psychosis. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. So I'm not touching too much into it, except to say that we worked with Dr. Ashok Mala for about 10 years. We have an early psychosis, our first episode uh, psychosis clinic. And then with Swaran Singh, who is also your, one of your alumni and who will be talking tomorrow, we worked with Swaran. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we also worked on first episode psychosis. So we have established an FEP program at SCAF with a very dedicated multidisciplinary team, and we have developed protocols for the management of FEP cases. But as I said, more details, will uh, I'll talk about it tomorrow, so I don't want to uh, say it now. The other study is a big study that I mentioned with Swaran Singh and with McGill University, Ames in Delhi being one of the centers, where we saw about, we screened about 15,000 uh, 15, students. It's one of the largest studies ever done among the student population uh, in schools and in colleges. And we screened for depression, anxiety, and psychosis. So this is another study. And believe me, we found 30% of them scoring on depression. It's an amazingly large figure for young people, you know, who don't articulate sometimes what they feel or, uh, you know, you're not clear about, but they just go one day and commit suicide. So, but this is a, a kind of warning signal for us that we really need to focus on the young people because 30% of them scored on depression and about 21% on anxiety. We also developed a youth mental health service program. It's called the SCARF YMH model. <clears throat> we have published it. And we do a lot of peer support in education institutions. We found that uh, they are much more forthcoming when it comes to talking to their own peers than to psychiatrists or psychologists. So we are continuing to train peers. We have a beautiful, huge, sp safe space, which is called Rhymes, in SCAF, where you can see this building. All these kids come, they do what they want. You know, basically, a lot of activities, games. It's in a very uh, this does not. This building does not have any boards on top saying SCARF or anything like that. See, even in SCARF, they're reluctant to come to SCARF because they say, what is this schizophrenia? Of course, now there is Dr. Google who tells you everything, whether right or wrong. So they all know what schizophrenia is, right? So they say, you know, we are not having schizophrenia. And if at all, they tell others that they are coming to SCARF, they say, I'm going to work there. You know, so that, that's how it is. But unlike that, this space is non-stigmatized. Nobody makes any judgments. Nobody gives them a diagnosis. Nobody tells them, do this and do that. So they are very much on their own. And of course, we have a series of programs for that. We are, of course, we have also concentrated a lot on youth leadership. I won't go into that. 
So all this work with youth and early psychosis led to the establishment of the youth mental health to provide literacy, positive mental health, and so on. We have established a youth advisory panel, very smart kids who are able to articulate so well about their problems. A large number of these problems are to do with their relationship with fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers, you know, across generations. Uh, and so we have developed youth-friendly spaces. But I do believe that this is a challenge that we are facing for the next 50 years. You know, uh, of course, COVID has kind of highlighted the whole thing, like he said. Uh, but this is something that we really need to mobilize resources for and uh, target the youth in a big way. I don't know if PJ has a program for youth specifically, but if you don't have, you must think of initiating something. It's well worth uh, doing that. We did a lot of genetic studies with Dr. Brian Maury in, in Queensland. I, again, I'm not going to uh, details, uh, but my premise was, I'll tell you what I thought and why it was important. We studied the Tamil Brahmins. And the reason I wanted to study them at that point in time was, I felt there was more and more intercaste marriages happening. See, in our generation it was less, but if you take the next generation, almost every family they marry outside the community or outside the caste. But for genetic studies, that's not going to work. So if you want to say, okay, like pure breed, like they say with dogs, you know, so pure breed, then you need to have an absolutely homogeneous population. So luckily we got, we got hold of, uh, you get more of these in rural areas. It's only in the cities we go all over the place, right? So in, I mean, I'm not, please don't think I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm merely talking about it from a genetic study point of view. So we did this study, and we got this very nice, we also worked with the University of Madras, and we got a very nice finding where there is a particular gene that was responsible for niacin regulation. And that was the problem in persons with schizophrenia. That was our finding, one of the findings. So we are now administering niacin to persons with schizophrenia as an RCT and trying to see if it works or not. We are also measuring metabolites. You know? So that's, that's what one of the things when I said research must feed into practice or clinical care. Let's see. I mean, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. The pilot study, the findings were inconclusive, but I think that's because of our data. Uh, I mean, the sample selection was flawed. But now we are going to, we are in the process of initiating that. Then from youth, we moved to dementia. We have started a dementia clinic, which is initially funded by Infosys Foundation, uh, where we do the entire works, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> training families, support groups, awareness, and so on. Um, we do a lot of cognitive simulation therapy, and, and we have done a lot of these uh, projects uh, with international funding, some of them with international funding. This is one of the nice uh, projects we did. We have a robo there, a hybrid phase robo for persons with dementia. And it is really very, uh, uh, and this robo fellow is very engaging, you know, I mean, sorry. Uh, what a, uh, he's really engaging, he's able to engage persons with dementia much more than you or I talking to them. Uh, so we are, we are still in the process of uh, uh, evaluating this, but this is something that has uh, come out from the uh, dementia uh, department. So these are all our research collaborations, both outside India and within India. I would especially like to thank my colleague, who, uh, Sujit John, who has been with us for many years. He's a joint director of research, and he really uh, uh, helped me to put together all these slides because he's really in the thick of all research programs. So what's the agony? Yeah, as you know, that was my title. Agony and ecstasy. So the, the agony was, in the initial 10 years when SCARF was founded, people came and asked us, what is this word schizophrenia? We are not able to understand it. We are not able to pronounce it. You know, what on earth is this? Why don't you change the name? You know? But Dr. Menon was very particular that unless we keep using that term, people will not 
it will not register in people's minds and they won't even bother to look up and see what it is. So we stuck to the term. So initial 10 years or even 15 years, building infrastructure was very difficult. There's no sustained flow of funds in an NGO like PGI or NIMHANS or, uh, you know, AIMS. We don't have that kind of financial support. You know, we are, we are poor, much poorer people uh, when it comes to uh, flow of funds. And uh, we had to strike this very delicate balance between care and research because, as I said, there, even within the organization, there were people who were questioning us why research. And as you know, in India, we don't really teach too much research. How many of us have got trained in research through formal training? Some of us have gone abroad, taken short fellowships, and, and come back. But formal training in research is just beginning in the last few years. But when we first started SCARF, we didn't have anybody who was actually formally trained in research, and as I said, why research? But what, what was the good news? The good news was that we have established credibility both nationally and uh, internationally. We are the WHO collaborating center. We work closely with the central and state governments because I believe that NGOs can only create models. If these models have to be scaled up, you need government. I mean, I firmly believe in that. Because how can SCARF, we have created excellent models, but how can we work in all parts of, even Tamil Nadu is difficult, let alone other parts of India. So I think it is imperative that NGOs work closely with government and vice versa, you know, and we don't see each other as competitors. We have expanded our activities and areas of work like youth mental health and dementia. Uh, we are teaching the National Board students for in psychiatry. And of course, some of you might know, we started, we do this ICONS, is a, a international conference on schizophrenia, which we do every two years, and we run diploma courses. So this is our team. Uh, it was taken a few weeks ago during the ICONS 10. We started with two staff members initially, when we started, one part-time psychiatrist and one psychologist. That's all we were able to afford when we first started. So it's very nice to see that team has expanded so well. And now we have a little more men also. Otherwise, it was <laughs> rather female dominated, but for all the good reasons, I suppose. But now we have a lot of smart uh, young men as well in our team. So I'll tell you a joke about this. Just read it. I'm stopping with this. This is my last slide. So I show this slide when I talk to young people and say, listen, you people have to work hard, you know, and all that. So what happened was, about two months ago, I had been to a college. So as usual, I show, you know, we hardly change our slides, right? So I showed the same slide. And then uh, some people applauded. <laughs> but then one man stood up in the audience and he said, uh, he was obviously a lecturer. It was a college, right? So he said, Madam, I think what you are doing is saying is very wrong. I, I said, why? What is wrong about it? And you said, they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. Are all, all these boys and girls toiling on their Instagram and mobile phones? How many of them even sleep before 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock? So are they all going to become great? I said, honestly, I had not seen this, that perspective. Neither had Longfellow probably had. But isn't that a situation that we come across in every home now? You know, parents come and say, he locks up the door at 10 o'clock. He's on his phone or he's on his uh, uh, laptop or whatever, right? So, I mean, the world is changing. Maybe I should stop showing this slide, I think. But <laughs> this was an insight that I got from this lecturer. So I stop with this and uh, thank you once again. Sir, and thanks. All of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I feel that we don't have enough words to thank you for this wonderful oration. Now I would request Dr. Ipsita and Dr. Rika to, pre to hand over mementos to uh, director, sir, to present to ma'am.
I now propose a vote of thanks. I sincerely extend my gratitude to Professor Vivek Lal, Director PGI, who took out his valuable time out of his busy schedule to grace the occasion. I will also thank Dr. Tara Rangaswamy for accepting and delivering a wonderful Professor NNV Goreshan. I would also extend my gratitude to the current Dean of the Institute, past directors, deans of the, past deans of the PGI, uh, Professor Emeters, and past faculty members of the Institute who have come for the oration. I thank all other dignitaries, DDS sir, FA sir, superintendent sir, senior faculty members of the institute, all assembled faculty members of different departments, uh, professional staff and students. I also would extend my thanks to Professor Biman Sakya and members of the telemedicine department of PGI for live telecasting the program. I also would extend my gratitude to all other dignitaries in this dais as well as present online. Uh, and we have sincerely made our best efforts to make this oration successful. However, if there are some shortcomings, kindly pardon us. Now I shall request you all to rise for the national anthem. Thank you all. Now I would request you all to kindly join us for tea in the